This is Deborah Atkinson, and you're listening to Flipping 50, where I address your top questions and challenges. I share with you what to eat, how to move, and how to change your thoughts so you can flip 50 and have a better second half. And my guest today, I am so excited to introduce, this is going to be like sitting on the couch with an old friend today. And I mean prior friend, not old, okay? So let's just get that straight. (laughs) I'm introducing today my friend, Susan McDamee. She has been a guest on the Flipping 50 podcast before. She was a guest years ago when the two of us were doing, I believe, or had done the Boulder Ironman for the first time. And she's back because she is about to do her eighth Iron Man. And she is quite an example of flipping 50 in so many ways. And I am so glad to have her here today. Susan, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I'm honored. Well, and you know what we're all about here. So we're about flipping the idea of settling for anything after 50. And in this second 50, looking at what are the stereotypes and getting out of it. And I'll tell you that the stereotype is certainly not, let's go do an Ironman triathlon. And let me describe that for listeners who are out there knowing triathlon that involves the swim, the bike, and the run. To be specific, an Ironman triathlon is kind of the the big event. And it is a 2.4 mile swim, usually in open water, in some cases in the ocean. (laughs) And we'll talk a little more about that in a little bit. 112 mile bike ride, followed by a 26.2 mile run, in other words, a marathon. So all of this does happen with a little buffet. There are, there are snacks along the way, but it is by no means an easy event that someone would casually say, I think I'm going to do that. However, Susan, uh, just to refresh listeners' memories or someone who hasn't had the privilege of listening for the first time, is that a little bit of what you did? <laughs> the very first time you signed up for an Ironman. Oh. The first time I signed up for an Ironman, I couldn't even swim. I know, right? So I, I just did it because I had been a cyclist. I'd, I'd been a runner for a few years and then um, stopped running for 13 years and then took that up again, did some marathons, and then um, stopped doing that because I wanted to start bike riding. And I didn't know you could do two sports at one time. Why would anyone do that? We started bike riding and doing, you know, some of the the longer rides, the organized rides. And then I thought, you know, I want to get back into running again. And why don't I just learn how to swim? Because everybody in Colorado is a triathlete. Why don't, you know, at that point I was 60 years old. And so I told my coach I wanted to do that. And he goes, great. He was a former pro Iron, Iron Man athlete himself. And um, so I signed up for swim lessons and signed up for my first Ironman, September of 2012, and it was for Ironman Wisconsin, which was September 2013. Um, so yeah, I just kind of jumped right in. Yeah, and I think I met you in the spring of 2014. You were one of the, I swear, one of the first set of people that I met when I landed in Boulder, and still among my favorite people in Boulder. <laughs> so you know. Having watched you, when I met you, you just had that one under your belt. This is number eight. You have not let any grass grow under your feet, girlfriend. No, I haven't. That's a, And that's a lot of racing since 2013, I'm realizing. <laughs> because not only is it number eight Ironman, but I've done yeah. seven or eight half Ironman you know, races, um, which one of them was the World Championships this summer. Um, which I'd qualified for and, you know, some. Sp- okay. Limp- okay. Let's just not gloss over that because, because you just like casually nonchalantly are mentioning world championships. Right. That's a big deal. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. And it's what happened was I went to do Costa Rica half Ironman and um, came in first place at that race, which qualified me for the world championships 
this sum, this summer, which were held in um, Chattanooga. And I went and did that. And it was just, I mean, the most amazing experience that I had ever had. I mean, it was amazing. I had to keep pinching myself that I'm at a world championship race. And um, to back up two weeks before, was it two weeks or the month before the world championships, I did Boulder Half Ironman and came in third place and first and second place turned down the world championship slot for 2018. So I had the opportunity to have it roll down to me. Um, but I thought, ah, you know, I'm not going to do it. And, you know, I don't, you know, it's in South Africa next year. It's just too much money. And so I passed on it. And then I went to do the world championship race in Chattanooga and had the most amazing experience of my life and thought I will never pass on an opportunity like that again, because you just never know when it's going to come up. And so then two weeks later, I did Augusta half Ironman and, you know, I was still recovering. And I asked my coach, said, should I just go and do the swim or do the swim and bike? Or should I just go watch all my friends? And he said, no, go race it. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm 65. Don't I need to recover? And so I went out there with an attitude, you know, like, just go out and have fun and do my best. And there were 10 women in my age group, which is sort of an advantage of being older, although these ladies tend to be so fast. Um, and I got finished with the race, and a friend of mine was in the little holding pen where you could get your free beer and your pictures taken. And he had finished way ahead of me and was, like, on his third beer and I went up to him and he had his phone and I said, Oh, can you check, you know, in my results? I just want to see what place I was in. So he pulled it up. He goes, your first place. I'm like, what? <laughs> and he shocked because that meant that I qualified for the world championships for next year in South Africa again. So I'm actually a double oh qualifier. Um, in fact, I was so in shock. I made him refresh his phone like five times. <laughs> like, no, 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 no. And when, Clearly, the universe wants you to go to South Africa. Yeah. So I went when they called me up on the stage. I kept thinking they're going to say they made a mistake, and they did. <laughs> so I signed up for South Africa for next year, which I'm very excited about. So that is so exciting. Okay, so I, I have a question. So all of this, the races, the half marathon or the half Ironmans. I mean, that's that's still no small feat, really, right. and. Um, you know, what's propelling this? So what, what keeps you going? So for listeners, you know, who might be thinking, you know, this is, um, I don't know, self-indulgent. This is, you know, just, uh, you know, a fun pastime or a hobby or somebody's got so much time on her hands. You know, I want to clarify what it's like to actually put this much time and discipline into what we're doing. I mean, it's, you get up early in the morning to fit things in and you, you sacrifice some things. You're in bed early. <laughs> you're, you're careful about what you eat and drink. And, uh, you know, it's, there is something to it. It's not simply a whim or, you know, you, it may be somewhat self-indulgent, something we we want to do, but there is a lot of discipline and willpower around doing it. So what is it that keeps propelling you? You know, I hear people say self-indulgence and that it's a selfish mm -hmm. sport, and I really disagree with that. Yeah. Because, you know, I mean, for example, my brother and his wife love to go RVing and they love to go to all the barbecue places. And that's what they do. And that's their passion. But no one would ever say, oh, that's self-indulgent. Mm -hmm. um, my oldest son loves to go golfing and mountain bike riding, and he does it every chance he can, and he races. But, you know, no one calls that self-indulgent. But yet you get into Ironman or triathlon, and people are like, oh, it's so self-indulgent. That's, you know. So it's funny because it's I've, I've taken mm -hmm. offense at that thought process because for me, you know, I'm an older in-life athlete. and I'm extremely healthy. I'm very fit, you know, nutritionally, physically fitter than many younger people. And I feel amazing. I kind of feel like I've redefined aging for myself. And I recreated my career when I was 61, 62 years, 62, I guess, or maybe, no, I guess I was, yeah, 62. 
um, cause I'd been in the same career for 30 years and that kind of ended. And so I had to reinvent myself. And so I look at all of this as part of it and I'm happy, um, the community of people that I've met through triathlon is like next to nothing. The people you meet will do, I find that they do anything for anyone. You know, they're givers and they volunteer. And if someone is in need, they're the first people to jump in. I mean, I I had a friend that lost everything in the recent flood in Texas, you know, and she's a triathlete. And the people that put, put together like $100,000 or something like that through a GoFundMe, for her family, wow. her children, because they lost everything. And you see this all the time. Look in your family's situation where you had a, yeah. you know, a situation. And it's like exactly just rally. And that, to me, is what this sport is about. When I got freaked out about open water swimming, you know, I got a little package in the mail from one of my triathlon friends who lives in Texas and or, you know, where she lives, I don't know. Um, and... It was this beautiful bracelet with the life preserver on it and this card about just think of this as a life preserver and you can do this swim. And I mean, just the thoughtfulness. So for me, it's not self-indulgent. It's also about being um, an inspiration to others to show that, you know, yeah, I'm 65 and yeah, I work out hard, but I also have balance with my job because it's my career because that's how I support myself. You know, I do have adult kids and grandchildren who feel that I should maybe stop doing this. Um, But it's like, stop and do what? Go bowling? You know? Great. I mean, I do those things. I stop taking ski and, you know, I want to get a fat tire bike and, you know, I go to concerts and I go to, you know, the opera and I, I mean, I'm having the time of my life. And a good case in point was Sunday I was um, at, at, um, a race in Florida. I was sure before a very dear person, dear to me person. And as he went in to do his swim, I was talking to an older lady and she's a triathlete, but she was not racing. She was watching the race. And I said, well, how old are you? And she said, I'm 80. And I said, you know, how, you know, do you like doing triathlon? She says, I love it. And she said, and all my friends, I live in a retirement community. They tell me I should stop that. It's bad for my knees. And she goes, I just tell them, heck no, I'm not stopping. <laughs> she goes, I want to sit down and play cards. And I just, you know, and so I told her kind of, you know, what, what my kids' thoughts were. And she goes, well, don't even listen to them. You just keep going. And then I was watching um, the swim exit, and there was a, it was a two-loop swim, and a man came out to do, start a second loop. And I noticed his age on his calf, and he's 80 And his wife was standing in front of me cheering and blowing him kisses. And I looked at her. I said, this is beautiful. And I said, when did he start triathlon? And she said, oh, he started when he was 70. And he just loves it. And we travel all over. And I just watch him. And he has so much fun. And I thought, you know, this is what it's about. People Mm -hmm. enjoying their life regardless of their age. And you do, you know, you see all abilities out there. You see all shapes and sizes. And it's, mm-hmm. there was a man there, Hector Picard, who you probably have heard of, that lost both of his arms in a horrific accident several years ago. He does this, you know, he has, doesn't have arms, and yet he still finds the way to do it. There's another gentleman getting off his bike, and he had prosthetic legs. And it's, it's just inspiring. I'm inspired so much by every single person that I see doing triathlon. I mean, it's just, so that's why I do it. That's why. Yeah, totally agree. And I, I love a couple of things that you've said. And first, I think all of us, we need to go back and visit our thoughts about, you know, running has notoriously been talked about as, you know, it's, it's so bad for the knees. And, you know, really only only certain people, only people who start later in life have, you know, good ability to run later in life. So it's almost as if your running life has a lifespan. And if you did it earlier, you may not be able to do it longer late in life. But the truth about knees and running is that runners are lighter and their knees are often better. The problem with running is if you're heavy. So if by running or by other exercise, you take the excess weight off, you take the pressure off the knees, 
and you're actually lubricating those joints. And I think triathlon is such a great example of you're cross training, you're using your upper body, you're using your lower body, you're unweighted when you're on the bike and in the in the water. You're not always beating up the same muscles like so many of us, I think, or maybe earlier in our lives, even I know in mine, or um, others who might be listening, we tend to gravitate toward one activity we really like. And then we do that over and over. And you know, we would be able to do that one passion more longer in our lifetime if we balanced it with other activities that balanced our bodies better. Do you agree with that? Have you noticed the change when you were running only versus now triathlon training, just the balance in your body and the way, way aches and pains heal and, or, or don't haunt you? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, I'm not a fast runner, although I've gotten faster this last season, which is kind of nice. Um, I hear older people, older, quote unquote, say, oh, I'm getting older, so I won't get faster. But maybe because I started so slow. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of like, yeah, let's flunk on the first day of school, like the exam, right? <laughs> so I can get better. But, you know, I love that. And that actually brings it back to something I'm scribbling notes here, questions I want to come back to. I love something you said in the opener that you may not even realize that for listeners, I want to call your attention to, you know, I think I was 60 and then I asked my coach, you know, which I think is a revelation. Now, a lot of people out there may be 60 and listening and have a trainer, or maybe you're in a program of mine. So you do have a coach, but looking at, you know, being 60 and having a coach, like an athletic coach, coat. That's an anomaly. I mean, it's, it's no wonder why the term is thrown around that maybe doing something is self-indulgent, you know, because it's no surprise, you know, still 70 to 80% of the population is not doing enough physical activity to improve their health, let alone their fitness. So you are swimming upstream if you're doing something else, but does that make you self-indulgent? I don't think so, but I think it's, super exciting that that you have a coach right i mean that's not normal and maybe in boulder it is so i have to say that (laughs) but i think having a coach is important because yeah i think it's too easy and i see it at all ages um of some of my friends that may be self-coached too easy to under train or over train or not know when you need to back down. And a good example is, you know, although I was coached last year, um, it was a different coach and he was, he's an amazing coach and he's coached many pros and age groupers and he definitely knows what he's doing. But for me, um, I felt like I was overtrained and some of that is my fault because I didn't speak up. So, you know, the coach can't read your mind and it's a good lesson that you need to speak up. And I ended up with adrenal fatigue, which um, kind of took me, I mean, I continued with my season, but it made it where it was not fun and, you know, was actually DNF'd, which means did not finish um, two races, you know, two of my key races, because I just didn't have it in me. And I ended up going to a new coach for this season and, you know, I've reduced my training and I've actually had a stronger, better season. I've been able to really get my health well and do way better and have a blast again. So kind of my analogy here, because people ask me how long they think I'm going to do this. And and I don't know. My answer is I do not know. But kind of like musical chairs, that as long as the music is playing and when it stops, there's a chair left, then I'll continue. Um, so... Well, and and talk to me about when they say do this, I mean, do they mean, do you mean, you know, Ironman or do you mean triathlon in general or, you know, that that's a big question, right? Yes, triathlon in general. And, you know, I, like you are, am several days out from doing Ironman number eight and I'm thinking I will never do another one, but I... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> until monday <laughs> yeah and i have one already that i'm paid for for june but after that i'll never do another one so <laughs> i liar liar pants on fire yeah, that's, right. a, that's a, the way we get you know right before races i think <laughs> exactly <laughs> 
Okay, so we have you have let the cat out of the bag, so I have to let everybody know. So Susan and I are both racing on Sunday in Cozumel. So we will be, uh, I will be anyway, struggling to have Thanksgiving out of the country, which I've done that once and I found it very, very lonely and odd. <laughs> so yeah, it's my first my first Thanksgiving not to be with my kids. Yeah. Yeah. Very different. But, you know, I found it also very, I was grateful probably more than ever for all I had had for, you know, decades that, you know, I, I appreciated it and I loved tradition. I knew it and I knew what I had, but when it's not there, then wow, then you really know that it's something. So let's talk though about the, you know, the travel and the destination Ironman. So not just, you know, Boulder Ironman is fantastic because we can sleep in our own beds, but you know, the, the destination and you've done several. So what is that like? Let's describe that traveling to somewhere foreign, um, whether it's a foreign country or just foreign to you, what is that like that obstacle? Um, well, I don't speak Spanish, other than very little. So it sounds See. like when I went to um, Costa Rica to race, that it, you know, it wasn't too, it wasn't horrible, and you know, I just I don't know meters to yards or <laughs> miles, so I just know I have to go 112 miles on the bike, and they'll have it listed as meters there, and I'll just have to look at my Garmin. <laughs> so <laughs> you know how close I am. Um, but, you know, big thing is remember your passport. Mine's been out on my dresser for a month now. Um, and then I always like to have my own food. And so, you know, traveling with your own food to another country can be a little different. I've raced in Canada as well, um, which was that wasn't as challenging as I think. I think this trip will be the most challenging, though, just because of the way I'm getting there, I'm flying into Cancun and then taking a bus to get a ferry and take a ferry over. And I'm like, Oh my goodness, you know, and I'll have my bike. I'm taking that with me. I don't know if you're taking yours or having it transported, but um, Mm -hmm. you know, and you can't take the CO2 with you and just, you know, the little things. um, But, you know, on one hand, I love racing local because number one, we know everybody here and we can train on our course but on the flip side, for me, traveling to a race is almost better because then when I'm at the race, it's about me. When I'm racing at home, it's still, I still have the laundry. I have the dogs. I've got the house to dust, you know, and so it's not just mm-hmm. race focused. So um, I find I can almost get more tired if I stay home rather than traveling for a race. That's such a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would have to agree with that. I think being somewhere else, you can kind of, there is no, no pile of work right. to do. And yeah. this one being, I'm actually, I don't know what day you're traveling. I'm traveling Thanksgiving day. So now I'm going to mm-hmm. take a little turkey sandwich on the plane. And <laughs> 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 my Thanksgiving. So that way. Fantastic. So no, I will already be there and my bike is already on its way. So yeah. It's been a little strange to to make all those little maneuvers, but talk a little bit about nutrition because I know that that's been a big part of your focus, big part of your success, and even a big part of kind of your transition with your own career in turning around and helping others with it. So, what have you found, and how have you found your way to a different? style of eating that works better. Well, it was interesting when I first started training for my first season and Ironman, um, my coaches would tell us all what to drink and how much fluid and what to eat when you're training and racing. And I listened and, you know, coaches should not do that unless they're certified to do so because they're just saying based on their experience and people they work with. But what I found is that, you know, it's not cookie cutter and I didn't need as many ounces of liquids per hour as others did. I didn't lose as much sodium or sweat. And, um, you know, at the end of my first season, I thought there's got to be a better way because I always felt bloated and just, you know, gassy and 
just, you know, like I didn't look lean, like an athlete would look doing all the workouts I was. And um, so I was introduced to a concept of eating, which is more of a lifestyle that transfers into your training and race day nutrition, and it's called metabolic efficiency training. And so I actually um, dabbled in that for myself and hired a, a um, certified metabolic efficiency specialist to help me with my next season. And it was night and day difference. It's, um, you know, when I say it's not a diet, it's because diets are not sustainable. And this is a way to eat for the, everybody should eat this way because you're controlling your blood sugar. And so when I adapted to that lifestyle, number one, my body leaned out, but my training went better. My recovery was better. You know, I didn't get that bloating and I didn't have to rely on sugary products um, when I was training and racing. So it was a whole paradigm shift in my thought process about what I should eat and very different than the way many athletes think, you know, no more carb loading and no more of those sugar products. I'm not going to name the names. Um, but so, and then after about a year of working with a professional, I decided to get certified in that because my career in publishing was en- coming to an end. And, um, I've always been fascinated by nutrition and I love it. So I got certified and have been for over two and a half years now, been working with athletes on their day-to-day nutrition and their training and race day nutrition. I've worked with hundreds of athletes and the majority of them have had amazing success. Um, But it's really, it's, and it's not cookie cutter. I work very with each individual and figure out what they need for their success. You know, some people can't have this some can't have that and blah, blah, blah. So you have to find out what works for them. But for me, it's really about um, controlling my blood sugar through my day-to-day nutrition, you know, so that I don't have those highs and lows of so fatigued or, you know, that you're so starving that you're going to eat anything that doesn't move, you know, and I don't crave sweets anymore. And so I've just found a really wonderful way to keep myself fueled in off season, on season, you know, when training gets more intense and for racing and, you know, when all else fails when you're out there on the race course, you have to go to plan B because something's always going to happen. But um, it's, it's just been, it's been good. I have my own business, as I said, so I've been enjoying that a whole lot. And I love that, you know, I think one thing that you really, that you said really sticks out for me. And that is because I've had a conversation honestly earlier today and last night with some of my community members saying, you know, okay, what if let's just say you did this and you, you had this to satisfy a craving and then you still wanted something, you still wanted some sugar. What do you do? And I responded, I said, you're not going to like this answer, but I cannot remember the last time I had a sugar yeah. craving it just doesn't happen. It does. and, and that's just such a blessing. And I think it is a huge shift in, in the way you think about food and the way you're eating. I think there's a little discipline and willpower at first to change taste buds and shift, but then it's not, it's not about willpowering your way through it. Just you're satisfied. And it, yeah. You know, each person that take it's different. You know, if you would have told me two years, three years ago that I wouldn't crave ice cream and chocolate every day, I'd say there's no way. Uh, But I don't, you know, (laughs) but I I have also discovered the foods that trigger the cravings. So, you Mm -hmm. know. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. Right. Okay. So change with change with coaches. So when you need need a change, you change that. You've changed your eating style. One of the things I, I want to point out that I think is so fun that, I mean, you have such a social media presence. So before we conclude, I want to make sure people know where to find more Susan. But you also, at 65, you're a sponsored athlete. I'm doing air quotes over here. And I mean, you get, you get great stuff, girl. And, (laughs) you know, you represent some companies. I mean, talk about how does Uh that happen? Well, I, I know it's like, I still have to pinch myself because yeah, I had a dream company come to me um, and say, they want to sponsor me and I'm going to get free shoes this year, this next season. I mean, 
movie, you know, running Ooh. shoes. So it's like awesome. But oh no, not Jimmy shoes. shoes. <laughs> no, the one. Okay. Hey, but you just gave me an idea. Um, well, the books are not very comfortable. So, mind you. No. Okay. Well, I might need to edit that out if you're going to go no, to Jimmy Choo. No, no. But um, <laughs> okay. No, there's about four years ago, I had heard of Betty Designs and I had a friend that was on the team and they had um, applications if you wanted to be on the team for the next year. And I'm like, oh, I'll try. I'm old, but you know, and everyone else is young, maybe they'll want me. And I was accepted. And I'm like, I was the oldest on the team. And with that came many sponsors, which we get tremendous deals from and, you know, just fun. You have to promote them through social media and and so I've been on the team for <clears throat> three years. Each year you have to um, reapply. So the second year I reapplied and got back on. The third year I was asked to be back on. And then I'm going into my fourth season. I was asked to be back on again, but this time on the elite team. And there's only 12 women on the elite team. And so I was just, I mean, I like cried when I got the email asking me to like, oh. to five and I'm on an elite team. And it's just, I mean, it's fun. So I have different sponsors and, um, you know, it's just, it's amazing. I've got a massage therapist that sponsors me and a web designer that takes care of my web, you know, my web page and website. And um, they saw to local here in Boulder. You're familiar with them. And, you know, on oh, yeah. shoes, just, you know, Roca and Rudy and all these. I mean, I've got more sunglasses now than anybody should have. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I'm good for my sponsors because I really promote them and I do, you know, do purchase their products. So, yeah. Right. Well, and you don't want to be sponsored by somebody that you don't use or you don't like, but it's such a feel good. And what I love about it and love about the fact that they're sponsoring you, in fact, to coming back and asking you is clearly they too want to send a message to, you know, to America or to the world that, you know, there is a different way to age than we've ever seen it done before. And here you go. Here's a great example. Yeah. Don't let, don't let what your mindset, what you've seen before be the limiting exactly. factor. Yeah. It's, it's been, you know, my journey's just been so much fun. It's been so much fun. And anytime that somebody tells me that I've inspired them, I'm still in awe, you know, of that statement because I am inspired by so many people. And so, you know, I'm happy that I can give back you know, even though I don't, many times I don't realize I am. Um, but, you know, and even in our community, it's just, you know, it's just fun. It's just fun. I just, I love what I'm doing. And that sounds to me like the sweet spot and right where you would want to be. So where can listeners follow you and get more well, Susan? Um, my website is, it's called MacPerformance.com and that's M A C. P E R and then the number four. Um, it's an Mac per four M A N C E dot com. So Mac performance dot com and then Susan Mac me on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. I'm not, I don't have fancy names because then. Oh, well that's easy. <laughs> fancy names. I forget who they are. I don't know who they are. You know, if you call. You know. Exactly. Okay, so let me make sure I have Mac Performance and everybody listening, if you're walking or lifting or you're commuting, certainly don't stop, keep what you're doing. And this will be in the show notes. But Susan, let me just make sure. So it's Mac, P-E-R, the number four, M-A-N-C-E dot com. Gotcha. Okay, so in the show notes, and I'll link to Susan's sites on social so you can follow her too. And um, in Joy Betty Designs. So Betty's Fun and all of the other sponsors as well. If you're out there racing, base salt, you know, and some of the other things that she's mentioned or things you want to check out. So, Susan, thanks so much for being here and uh, good well, luck. Good luck on to Sunday. you. I can't wait to see you there and give you a big hug in person and maybe we can do a. I can't wait till Monday. <laughs> <laughs> well, <have> a beer. <laughs> 
<laughs> Absolutely. Or a margarita. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to be there. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much. And if you're listening and you have a question that you'd like to ask Susan, leave it below the show link at flipping50.com. Join us on the Facebook fan page at Flipping 50 TV. And if you enjoyed the show, please leave a rating in iTunes. It really helps. And then share this with a friend so you can surround yourself with a supportive community of women on the same journey. What are you waiting for? Start Flipping 50 today.